You may be seated. You know, uh, there's a movie on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. The author of that song right there, Our God is an Awesome God, is Rich Mullins. Rich Mullins, uh, the movie is called Ragamuffin, Ragamuffin Band, uh, and it's about his life. Uh, he's one of the greatest, I think, personal opinion, I believe he's one of the greatest Christian songwriters, but when you see the movie, you'll see why. You'll see he pours out his heart to God repeatedly because he's had some hurts and habits and hang-ups that you'll see displayed in the movie uh, that have caused him to really turn to God. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. When we talk about the Beatitudes, we talk about those eight principles that God gave us in those uh, Beatitudes. Uh, for us to be able to turn our hearts towards God, for us to be able to give things to God, and how wonderful it is. Before we get started on that, I just need to, to let you know, I, I really appreciate Brandon's sermon last week. Didn't you appreciate that? Uh, I didn't get to see it yet, but I, I heard that, that God really blessed through it. Now, I do need to inform you, though, it will be the last time you will ever hear from Brandon. <laughs> Because we can't have that, him doing a better job than me. It makes me look really bad. You know, and I, I warned him. I, I warned him before. You do too good a job, buddy. You won't get to preach again. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> of course, we'll hear from him again. But I, I do appreciate him uh, standing in uh, for me. I got to uh, preach up at a uh, former church, a uh, church up in Oregon that was celebrating its 50th anniversary. I was pastor of that church for 16 years before I came here. Uh, and it was neat to be there. God gave me a wonderful recall because I don't usually have this. And I prayed about it. God gave it to me. I, I, I was able to call everybody's name out from that church that I knew except for one who will remain nameless <laughs> because I still can't remember. <laughs> uh, but it was really neat to be up there and to celebrate with the church 50 years of ministry. One of the things we celebrated uh, with the church is that during the 50 years they had over 900 recorded baptisms. Isn't that pretty cool? 900 people that recorded. Now, I understand there were more people that made decisions. You always know that. There's some people didn't get baptized. Sometimes a record got lost or something like that. But 900 people in the kingdom of God because God was working through that church. Isn't that great news? I remember a few uh, letters that we got at the church. We got some letters saying uh, congratulations to us from the Northwest Baptist Convention among the Southern Baptist churches there. Uh, we had the highest baptisms per capita several years in a row. It was kind of neat to get that letter. And then one year, 2003, they, they put that uh, letter or letter in the history book uh, that they gave out to us. And it was we had the most baptisms of any church in the Northwest uh, for that year in the Southern Baptist Convention. I, I think that was pretty cool. Amen? Now, can God do that here? I, I, I believe he can do that. And I think it, last week was an illustration of that. It's great to hear there's some decisions made last week uh, when uh, Brandon was, was pe uh, preaching. I, 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 boy, we need to hear more of that. We need to see more of that. I am a little upset, though, because a historian recorded for all time put into the church written history my most embarrassing moment. It was a Mother's Day. Mother's Day is coming up pretty soon. It was a Mother's Day, and I was preaching out of the book of Ruth. We had two services there, just like we have here, uh, and uh, the first service went pretty well. My mom was visiting from Colorado up there, uh, uh, for the first time, she was in the ser uh, service with us. And, and so the second service, when she was in attendance, I said, everyone turn to the book of Ruth. And I don't know who did it, but somebody took the book of Ruth out of my Bible that Sunday morning. <laughs> I looked, and it wasn't there. And I looked again, and it wasn't there. All this time, I'm trying to kill time. You know how speakers do that. Uh, yeah, isn't the color of the carpet nice this morning? <laughs> uh, finally, out of uh, pity, one of the youth, one of the young children, brought their Bible up, turned to Ruth. 
I had found it that by that time, but it was already too late. It was very, very embarrassing. It is now in the written history of the church forever. <laughs> a very humbling moment. <laughs> We're going to talk about being humble this morning as well. Uh, before we get started, we have a special treat. Every uh, one of this series, of the Beatitude series, we have eight sermons. There's going to be a testimony before uh, the sermon. So, Ruth, would you please come? Ruth Grass is going to uh, give us a testimony of how God has worked in her life through one of our ministries called Celebrate Recovery. Uh, and so, Ruth, would you share with us? Now, we don't have to go over again. <laughs> <laughs> All the instructions, remember, speak into the mic. <laughs> it will. It's a brown thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> And it's working. Right now. Okay. Well, hello. Whoa. <laughs> I am Ruth Grass, and I'm a very grateful believer in Jesus Christ. A survivor of sexual abuse, I struggle with chronic pain, and I'm working on recovering with codependency. It's kind of funny how I started going to CR, and at that time it was in the other church building. And CR was on Wednesday nights, and Dave and I used to go to uh, listen to the praise team practice almost every Wednesday night, which was one of the highlights of my week. And one day at church, Kate had approached me and mentioned that she thought that my struggle with chronic pain would be a big benefit to the group, um, but she had no idea how deep my closet was at that time. Anyway, I had no intention of ever going. Come to find out, my husband wanted to attend the meetings, and he wanted me to go. Well, I reluctantly said, okay, but if I hate it, I'm walking to the church and listening to the praise team. And I was pretty sure that's what I was going to end up doing. But instead, I was really surprised that night, that, and the testimony really touched my heart. And it made me start thinking that maybe it was time that I cleaned out my own closet. And after the group session, we broke into smaller groups. Men went one way and women went the other way. And I sat there and listened to these women open up and tell such personal themes of their lives, both from the past and the present. And it really shocked me how they could just blur it out like that. And on the first night there, I passed when it came my turn to talk. I had too much in my junk, too much junk in my closet, and I knew if I opened that door, it was going to flood the room. And that was my first night of CR. And I returned the next week and the next week, and I'm still attending, and I have earned my one-year certificate. Step studies has been the most beneficial part for my healing. It teaches us the steps that God has laid out for us to follow in order to be healed, including forgiving someone who has done us terribly wrong. And yes, it is possible. And you can't skip even one of those things in your closet or your, your healing is incomplete. And I know this because I tried. And James 5.16 Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Confessing the, to my friends that one thing that I buried back into the deepest corner of my closet was so hard for me to do, but I did it. Not with dry eyes, but it was out. And Matthew 5, 8, happy are the pure in heart. And the weight that came off of my shoulders was unreal. 
And without the support and encouragement and the prayers from the awesome CR group and Kate, I wouldn't have had that burden taken from me. And God has blessed me with some amazing friends in CR who truly care about each other's complete recovery. And they are not there to judge us. They just love us and want to help us heal. And that's why I love and am joining the leadership in Celebrate Recovery. And we're all broken in one way or another. And CR is broken people living for Jesus, helping other broken people come to know Jesus' healing power. A good description, really, of what the church's purpose is as well, right? Broken people coming to Jesus for healing and helping other broken people find the same healing in Jesus Christ. Really, our, our beatitude today talks about that. If you have your Bibles and return with me to Matthew chapter 5, this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it was delivered at the edge of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this particular place uh, has amazing acoustics. I, they actually built a, uh, a Constantine built a, a little uh, chapel there. And uh, Chris and I got to go there with our group. And you can sing in this chapel. And even I sound good in that chapel. I, I'm telling you, it's amazing. That's a miracle, isn't it? Right? If you've ever heard me sing, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> but it, it's a beautiful place. The acoustics on this mountain is, is wonderful. Uh, Jesus was set down on the mountain to teach, and there were over 5,000 men, not including women and children, who heard these words as he proclaimed them. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, would you please stand in honor of God's word as we read it together? Verse 1, and we're just going to read a very few verses, 1 through 3. When he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you, Lord, for these blessings that you're pronouncing upon uh, your disciples. And we pray, Lord, that we would be those learners, those disciples uh, that you have called us to be so that we can learn what your spirit would say to your church today. Uh, Father, how your spirit would speak to our individual hearts today. Lord, help us to understand uh, that even in our brokenness, Lord, you can bring healing. That, that you understand or you proclaim that there is a sense that we must be broken in order for healing to occur. Lord, help us to be able to be poor in spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be beginning this week a series of lessons uh, on the Beatitudes, uh, the Blessed Are series. Each week we'll be sharing a different Beatitude. Each week we'll be looking at the blessing that God has uh, for us uh, as a people. And I, I'm going to give you a clue at the, or a quiz at the end of it. We're, let's put together Blessed Are, and what is today's? Poor in spirit. And what's the final thing? See if you can find it. Right here. The kingdom of heaven. Okay? So at the end of our, our lesson, you're going to have to know all of these and be able to relate which one comes after the other. Right? <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but today we're going to talk about how it, it is a blessing to be poor in spirit. These uh, seemingly contradictory statements that Jesus makes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That seems like a contradiction, right? Uh, each of these beatitudes uh, is a way of looking at wisdom like the world has never seen before. Honestly, when you read the beatitudes, they don't match with what the world is saying. Uh, today, we would say, blessed are the rich, blessed are the wealthy, and blessed are those who have the most toys. You've seen the bumper sticker, <laughs> right? 
the he who has the most toys wins, or perhaps the one uh, that says that uh, uh, whoever has the most toys when he dies wins, <laughs> you know? That's, that's the, the world's understanding. Jesus turns things upside down, and he helps us to see what it truly means to be blessed. Uh, oftentimes when we think of, of blessing, we don't think of humbleness. We don't think of, of being broken. We don't think of how that could be a blessing, and yet it is. If we look at this theme verse for today, it says, For everyone who exalts himself uh, will be humble, and he uh, who humbles himself will be exalted. That's backwards, isn't it? Usually it seems like the people who ex exalt themselves are exalted and the people who humble themselves are meek, mild, mealy-mouthed wimps. And that's what we might think. But that's not what Jesus is proclaiming here. And I think when we see that what he means in this blessed are, in the Beatitudes, we'll understand it better. Uh, you know, all the Beatitudes start with blessed are. Uh, what does that mean? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And, and, and when we read that, it sounds like what we're saying uh, is just a mere statement, blessed are. But really what we're reading uh, is an exclamation of God's blessing. In the Aramaic, there is no uh, R in that statement. There is no verb in the statement. Uh, blessed, the poor in spirit. Uh, we might uh, be able to say it like this, that all oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit. Now, it's not that big of a distinction, but I think it is a somewhat of a distinction for us to understand that these are proclamations that Jesus are making, is making. And it doesn't depend on us. All we have to do is be poor in spirit. And he says, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Uh, the Psalms 1-1 said, How blessed is a man who walketh not in the counsel of the wicked, nor standeth in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. It's a similar statement. Blessed is the man. Jesus is saying, blessed are you when you're poor in spirit. Blessed are you. And he's going to continue throughout this, uh, these beatitudes with saying, blessed are us. We might say it, oh, the bliss of being a Christian. Or, oh, the joy of knowing Christ. Or, oh, the sheer happiness of knowing Jesus as our Savior. If we're going to understand that, we need to understand that there is a Greek word that represents that blessedness. The word for blessing in the Greek is makarios. Uh, it's a godlike joy. A joy that's untouchable by the things of the world. A joy that's not dependent upon the circumstances. A joy that's not dependent on what's happening around us. Uh, it differs from our word, and, and maybe your translation may say this. I would argue a little bit with your translation if it does. Your translation may say, happy is the man. Or in some word, use the term happiness. Well, the Greek word is so much deeper than happiness. If, if you were to, to study the, the word uh, happy, you would understand that the word happy has the ideal behind it uh, of, of, the, uh, of the ideal, um, it's not up there, I I'm, apologize, uh, of hap means chance. And so uh, someone who is happy is celebrating the chance, the, the circumstance. Now circumstances can make us happy, right? Yeah. Uh, I won the lottery this week. I mean, I'm happy. No, I'm kidding, I don't play the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> public committee will meet right after church <laughs> looking for a new pastor <laughs> I'm already in trouble you know Brandon did such a good job I'm afraid I don't have a job <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the circumstances have you ever had something really good happen to you have you ever, uh, you ever had that moment of joy or that moment of happiness that fleeting emotion now sometimes you can be happy for a whole day, right? 
How many of you ever had something really good happen? You're happy for the whole day. You go to bed happy. Of course, you wake up in the morning, but you go to bed happy for a whole day. Sometimes it only lasts an hour, but you're happy. Sometimes it only lasts a couple minutes, <laughs> but you're happy. And then it's gone. Then it's gone. That's not the blessing that this passage is using. The, uh, the idea of, of the Greek term for blessing there is rooted also in the Hebrew term. Uh, that means a, a kind of happiness, a kind of joy, uh, that is a joy that no matter what the difficulty is, you're happy. William Barclay says this, the Beatitudes speak of joy that seeks us through our pain. That joy which sorrow and loss and pain and grief are powerless to touch. That joy which shines through tears and nothing in life or death can take it away. That's the kind of joy he wants us to have. That's the kind of blessing that he is expressing to us. It's a blessing that's not dependent upon the circumstances that you're in. Because circumstances change, right? I mean, you have a good day and you have a bad day. You're up one minute and you're down the next, right? Uh, you surround yourself with people uh, who are downers and pretty soon you're down even if you were up. <laughs> uh, you surround yourself with people who are uh, joyful and pretty soon you're up even though you were down, right? The happiness is that way. But abiding joy doesn't depend on the people we surround ourselves with. Abiding joy doesn't depend on the circumstances we find ourselves in. This kind of joy that this Greek word represents is a kind of joy that will be the same throughout all circumstances because life isn't always fun. How many of you have discovered that? Anybody here? It's not always fun. It's not always happy. But you can be, have a joy in you that astounds the world. You can have a joy in you that will carry you through the ups and the downs. You can have a joy in you that is deep and abiding along with the peace and other fruits of the Spirit. You can have that kind of joy available to you. Blessed. Blessed is the man uh, who, who is able to be poor in spirit, uh, whose spirit is poor and what does it mean to be poor in spirit? The Greek for poor is, is the uh, patachis, uh, which is absolute and ab objective poverty. The Aramaic is ibion, which means a helpless man who puts his trust in God. If you look at those two words and think about those two words, and both words are used here. Jesus was speaking in Aramaic. He was translated into Greek uh, as well. Both of those words refer to someone who is bankrupt, uh, essentially, who doesn't have the reserves, doesn't have anything of, of their own to lean on, who, who trusts in God because they can't trust in themselves. Someone who is able to be poor in spirit is someone who is able to trust completely in God even though they can't help themselves. Oh, the untouchable joy of the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, the antithesis of, of being poor in spirit uh, is to have self in control. Antithesis means the opposite of. So you're poor in spirit in the biblical sense What's the exact opposite of that? Is to be rich in self. Is to have self in control. Is to have self ruling your life. The trouble with self in control is it's impossible to control ourselves. Have you tried that? Have you tried controlling yourself? What happens when you depend on your own power to live life the way you know you should live life? You'll always be disappointed. When self is in control, you are and I am out of control. Ultimately, if I'm only depending in myself, I do not have the power to live the kind of life that God wants me to live. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, we're real fond of sharing that passage when we talk about being new in Christ. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And what does it say next? The old things 
have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In order for things to become new, there must be a death of the old self. There must be a death of the old things. There must be a, a burial in order for there to be a resurrection. There has to be the caterpillar crawling into the shell in order for the butterfly to come out at the other side, right? And that's the way it is for us. There has to be that death to self. There has to be that death to our own will, our own desires, and submitting our will and submitting our desires to the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound like fun, does it? I'm telling you, you haven't lived a life until you've lived in the power of the Spirit instead of the power of self. When you are dependent upon God, when you're dependent upon His will, when you're dependent upon His power, boy, all of a sudden you're doing things you never thought you could do because God is working through you to do what only He can do through you. Amen? Uh, I, I'm, it's, it's good for us to be able to get rid of self. Uh, the, that, that trouble with self and control is we can't control ourselves. We need help. We need help, and, and, and that help is available through Jesus. Let, let me give you some examples of being poor in spirit. First of all, there's Moses. Moses was a, a man who was, the Bible declares, the most humble man. Did he start that way? I think Moses was pretty arrogant. I think Moses was pretty proud. He was, after all, Pharaoh's son, adopted son. Uh, he had the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, uh, the keys to the chariot at least, uh, and he could pretty much do with wanton abandon anything he wanted to do except what he did. And it wasn't until he came to the end of himself in the desert of Midian that he finally realized who God had really called him to be. When he came to the end of himself, then he became a new person to be able to lead the people out of bondage in Israel. Think about David. Uh, David's attitude as opposed to Saul's. David was a very humble man. Would not take advantage of opportunities to ascend to the kingdom that were presented to him because he knew it wasn't God's will yet and he was willing to wait upon God. Uh, there was a, he was a man after God's own heart. Because he put self to the background and put God on the throne of his life. Of course, the ultimate example is Jesus himself. And Philippians 2 says that we should have this attitude in ourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and became obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. He emptied himself. He was willing to put aside his own self-interest. In the garden, he prayed. Remember, before the crucifixion, he says, not as I will, but as thy, thy wills. It doesn't make, that doesn't, that's good, not good English, I'm sorry. <laughs> not as I will, but as you will, God. That's what we want. That's what I desire. A great example of n not living by self, but living by the Spirit of God. You know, we are called uh, to do that ourselves in this passage. Uh, oh, the untouchable joy of the man who has realized his own utter helplessness and has put his whole trust in God, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Uh, another way of saying that is uh, in Celebrate Recovery, uh, step one uh, says, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives had become unmanageable. In principle one, it says, realize I am not God. I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong things and that my life is unmanageable. Both of those say the same thing. I realize that myself is taking me down the wrong road, that myself is leading me on the broad path, and I turn instead to God. And I recognize that He is God and has the power to help me. 
my, uh, my wife, um, and, and this is my chance over the next few weeks to tell all kinds of stories on her. <laughs> you can repeat this one to her. Some of the other ones you, I'd just soon you stay quiet about. <laughs> but my wife had received uh, Jesus, and, and she was a believer in Jesus, and, and she was sharing with her sister about the Lord, and, and uh, her sister uh, was involved in some things, and I'd, I'd have to let you tell, or her tell you what she was involved in, but, uh, but she, she told my wife, she said, you know, your crutch is Jesus, and my crutch is this stuff. Uh, and it, it, either way, we both have a crutch. And my wife said, well, think about that, Vicki. Which crutch is better? Which crutch is going to do you more good? Yes, we both have crutches, but Jesus is my crutch that's never going to let me down. That's never going to lead me astray. That's always going to be there to hold me up. Now, which crutch is better? And I would declare to us today that when we become broken in our spirit, when we realize uh, that, that we are poor in spirit, then we open ourselves up to being rich in Jesus and rich in God and rich in his kingdom. This passage goes on uh, to talk about, uh, oh, the untouchable joy of the man who has realized his own uh, utter helplessness and has put his whole trust in God, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm reminded when I hear that kingdom of heaven of the Lord's prayer, the Lord was teaching his disciples how to pray. And part of his prayer is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those two things make up the kingdom of God. Now, ultimately, we know the kingdom of heaven is available to those who are willing to admit their sin, to be willing to be poor in spirit, admit their need for Jesus Christ, to ask him to come into their heart to be their savior. And oftentimes we stop with that. But honestly... If we're true to the scripture, someone who invites Jesus to be their savior isn't just talking about being saved from a fiery hell where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Not just asking not to smell of sulfur for the rest of their eternity, but they're asking Jesus to be their Lord as well. Jesus Christ the Lord. Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord? You know, that's really what this is talking about when it says, for when we combine thy will be done with thy kingdom come, we understand that when Jesus comes into our lives, it's not just a future kingdom that we're talking about. It's a kingdom of God who is present right now in us because Christ is in us. And where the king is, the kingdom is. Does that make sense? Where the king is, the kingdom is. And if he's in your heart, he has set up a rule and reign. If you keep kicking him off the throne, you're going to be in trouble. If you keep putting self back on the throne, there's going to be some consequences to pay. His desire is that his will be done in our lives. And I'm telling you, his will is better than our will. He has a better plan for your life than you have for your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. He has a better plan for your life than you can imagine. And he can use you in unique ways if you let him be on the throne of your heart and you take the self out of the way. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The kingdom of God is a society where God's perfect will is done. The kingdom of God is the place where God's perfect will is done. Is God's perfect will done in your heart? Then the kingdom has come in your life. Ultimately, it's going to be great when we get to go to heaven, right? How many of us want to go to heaven? Anybody here want to go to heaven? Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine. How many of you want to go to hell? Okay, that's good. <laughs> you may say, well, I want to go to hell with all my friends. Uh, <laughs> Man, you're not going to even know your friends are there. It's going to be pretty miserable. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. We want to all go to heaven. Thy kingdom come is available 
when his will is done in our, our lives. Uh, what happens uh, to be able to do the will of God, what we have to do, did I skip something? I'm sorry. Let me catch up with myself. Okay. Oh, what we have to do is be willing to understand our own utter helplessness. Honestly, according to those two principles, or that first step and the 12 steps and the, the first principle of the eight principles, we understand that we are helpless, that we are powerless is the way it puts it, that we are powerless to, to cure ourselves, powerless to help ourselves without Jesus Christ. You know, honestly, a celebrate recovery is different from uh, the AA in one sense. We are unapologetically Christ-centered. We don't just talk about a God out there. We don't just talk about your God can be the doorknob out there. That's famous for someone saying that once. Honestly, if your God's not Jesus Christ, you're, it's, <laughs> he's not going to do you any good. Not going to do you any good. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the one who can help us uh, with our, our difficulty. He's the one. Uh, we have to admit our utter helplessness. We have to admit our utter ignorance. And, and that's not an insult. It's not an insult. Ignorance means you just don't know. Honestly, do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Boy, if you could figure out even the weather, you could be famous. <laughs> But obviously, the weatherman hasn't figured it out <laughs> with all their tools. They still can't figure out what the weather's going to do tomorrow. Uh, we have to admit our own ignorance about what is best for us, about which way to go, about the consequences of each choice that we make. God has available for us knowledge. Uh, we have to admit our own inability to cope with life. Our own inability to cope with life. You, I was listening to the radio on my way home from Denver last night, and, and uh, it was a, a, a psychiatrist uh, talking about emotional pain. And he said that emotional pain is perhaps even worse than physical pain. Because physical pain, you can get over it. You can get it fixed. There can be some healing. It's, it usually lasts for a certain amount of time. Now, I know chronic pain is a little different, but what he's saying, in general, emotional pain tends to hang on and hang on and hang on. That's what we've got to turn over to Jesus. We have to admit our own inability to cope with life uh, because that emotional pain will lead us to depression. That depression can lead us into some horrible places and some dark valleys. We have to admit our utter dependence on God. I have to admit our utter dependence on God. Uh, the trouble is, though, what often happens sometimes is, is that we like to think we are God. Uh, we, we mess up our own identity. Rick Warren says this. He says, the biggest difference between us and God is God does not think he's us. <laughs> Oftentimes, we think we are God. We think we can determine everything. In James uh, 4, 7, and 8, it says, Submit therefore to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. We have to be, come to that point where we are willing to submit ourselves to the one person who can make a difference in our life, and it's not us. When we try to play God, what we try to do is we try to control our image. Uh, I think Brandon spoke about this a little bit last week, didn't he? You know, sometimes we put on a Jesus face, or, 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 or we try to, to make people think that we're more holy than we really are. We try to think, make people think that we don't have any issues. We don't have any problems. We don't have a closet, as was referred to earlier. But, but folks, honestly, we are those people. We do have closets. We do have issues. We do have different hurts, habits, and hang-ups, don't we? And to admit that we have those problems 
uh, is a very healthy thing to do. But we, we want our image to be protected, uh, that we have it all together. Uh, we try to control other people. Uh, we try to control them so that, uh, that they don't interfere with who, uh, what our image is. We try to control them uh, so that, that we can look better ourselves. And sometimes we step on other people trying to lift ourselves up, and it just doesn't work out well. Sometimes we try to control our problems and, and our issues, our, the, the things that we're involved in. We try to control them, and we're not successful at it. Maybe for a time we can be self-disciplined. Maybe for a time we can quit doing something that's bad, or, or maybe for a time we can do something that's good on our own, but after a while it will fail over and over again. Uh, and because of that, we end up with pain. We try to control our own pain. We try to administer our own medicine to our own pain. Uh, and it never works. It never works like it should. We can't do it ourselves. We have to admit our own utter helplessness to live life under our own self-control and self-power. And when we do that, we open ourselves up uh, to the possibility that God can do what we cannot because we're doing these things, there are some consequences. The first consequence is we fear. Uh, we fear we don't, we can't let people too close to us because we fear that they might really come to know us. They might not like us if they really got to know us. They, they might not uh, want to hang around us if we really revealed who we really are or what we were really thinking or what our hurts, habits, and hang-ups really are. Uh, when exactly the opposite is true, if we do like the Bible says, like uh, Ruth quoted uh, from James, if we confess our faults to one another, that becomes something that bonds us instead of separates us. So we have a, a irrational fear and we have frustration. We have frustration because whenever you try to control somebody else, you know what happens? They rebel. I don't know why. Obviously, I have their best interests at heart. No, honestly, I have my interests at heart, and I want to impose them upon them. Uh, you know, it, it, it's frustration uh, for us. Or, or perhaps we also have fatigue because we just wear ourselves out. It's exhausting playing God, right? Can you imagine? I mean, I, I can't imagine just being in charge of what I'm in charge of, much less being in charge of any portion of what God's in charge of, Right? And if we're trying to control others, if we're trying to make things happen, if we're trying to live out this plan that we have, uh, and we're, we're going to be frustrated, we're going to ultimately be fatigued. We're just going to get tired and exhausted playing God. And finally, uh, we also try to control our failures, and our failures always catch up with us. You just can't do it on your own. Honestly, folks, it's not a sign of weakness to admit that you need God. It is a sign of strength. The strongest you ever are is when you're on your knees. And what I mean by that is when you are in submission to God, you open yourself up to unlimited power, unlimited possibilities for your life. When you submit yourself to God, why do we resist it so? Why is our self so strong in control of our lives when we could turn it over to God and be so much better off, be far better off than we are? That's the consequences of, of playing God. What's the cure for playing God? And just very quickly, I'll share these, these with you. Number one, admit that you are not God. Okay, what I, I'm going to ask you to help each other out, okay? So would you turn to the person next to you and say to them, you are not God. <laughs> okay. Was that helpful? <laughs> now, I would ask, did they argue with you, but I don't want to know that. <laughs> the first step is to admit that we're not God. Now, what does that mean, anyway? I think it is an admission that we don't have the power, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the foresight, we don't have the ability to make things right in our lives. When we admit that we're not God, we give the opportunity for God to be God. 
Until we admit we're not God, there's no place for God to be in control of our lives. We have to admit that we're not God. We have to admit that we're powerless to control other people. Remember that, that principle that we talked about. Other people will act like other people act. Part of our steps in Celebrate Recovery is to, to do our best to make things right with other people. But you can't control how they respond. You can only control what you can do with God's help, right? We can't control other people. We, and it's not our business to control them. It's not our business to, to do that. We, we just have to admit that we're powerless to control their actions. The only person we can control is our own action. One of the things we're famous for saying in Celebrate Recovery is we don't try to fix anybody because you can't fix anybody else. Only God can fix us, right? Now, we can encourage one another, and we can exhort one another, and we can hold one another up in prayer, but God has to be the one that does the changing in an individual's life with the individual's uh, willingness to ad admit and to own up to that that right of God to do that. Third thing, we have to admit that I'm powerless to solve my problems on my own. I just can't do it. I know that's tough to do. But you wouldn't believe what that opens up. When you admit that you're powerless, you allow God's power to change you. What happens when you were saved? What did you have to do? when, you, In order to be saved, you had to admit that you were a sinner. You had to admit that there was nothing you could do about it. You had to believe that God had already done something about it through Jesus. Amen? Uh, and when you did that, you opened yourself up to being able to be saved, to be able uh, to be empowered, to be able to have the Holy Spirit in control of your life instead of you being in control of your life. And then finally, you have to admit that I am powerless to change my past. You know, I, I, I can't say enough about this because I think we really are creatures of our past. We really are so inhibited and so chained because of our past. When God's not concerned about our past, what does he do? He forgives us of our past, doesn't he? He will remember it against us no more. That's a biblical definition of forgive. I remember it against you no more. It's not that God didn't know it happened. Of course, he's God. But he doesn't hold it against us at all in any way. Why do we do that? Why can't we forgive ourselves of our past? Why do we let our past chain us? I'm telling you, if you'll let God be in charge if you'll let God have the reins of your life, you can forget about your past. Your past really can only be something that has informed you, that has helped you to be the person you are now in all the positive ways, but it doesn't have to be at all something that holds you back from being the person God wants you to be in the future. Amen? And the past can be gone forever if we're willing to give our lives over to Jesus Christ and trust in his future. Oh, how blessed is the man. Oh, let's look. How blessed is the man who realizes that, that he's not chained to his past. He's broken in his spirit. He understands that he is poor in his own ability to, to change the future and realizes that God can do it. He's rich towards God because he accepts God's will for his life. His is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? His is the kingdom of heaven. His is a, a life of blessedness, a life of joy, a life of eternal peace and satisfaction, a life that isn't hindered, isn't hampered, isn't held down by his own limitations e even because he's trusting in God. When you're poor in spirit, doesn't mean you're mealy mouth and weak, a wimp of a fellow. When you're poor in spirit, you allow God's spirit to make you powerful in his kingdom. 
powerful in this world that he has created. And you can act out of confidence. You can act out of a relationship with him, a, an acknowledgement of his will, and know that you are powerful because of that. You understand what I'm saying? I, I don't want us all to leave here thinking, okay, I've got to be humble. I want you to live, leave here knowing that Christ has made you, exalted you, that Christ has saved you, and Christ has a plan for your life that is so much better than any plan you could make. So you put aside self, and you put his spirit in charge of your life. And you can walk out of here confident, knowing that you're walking a path that's going to lead to the perfect will of God, which is always right and good. Amen? It doesn't mean it's always easy, but it's always right and good. And your joy, no matter what the circumstances, will help you through any of the circumstance. And your joy, no matter who you're around, will help you th even around difficult situations and difficult people. Your joy, your blessedness will pervade throughout your life because you were poor in spirit. And the kingdom of God is yours to live in your heart and empower you to live for Christ. Amen? And what a great joy that will provide for us. Would you bow with me, please, in prayer? If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, never given your heart to Jesus, I've outlined already through the sermon what you need to do. You first of all need to admit that you're a sinner, admit that you've done things wrong, confess that sin before God, ask him to forgive you of that sin, repent of that sin, commit with his help to not uh, live that way, but to live according to his spirit, accept him, as not just Savior, but also as Lord, because he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again, and is at the right hand of God now, so he is reigning. Acknowledge that he's reigning. Let him reign in your life as Lord. If you're willing to do that today, you can be saved. And you can know eternal life in his heavenly kingdom. Father, I thank you for the blessedness of being poor in spirit, and rich towards you. Of being poor in spirit. So that we can have the kingdom of God. Eternally. When you come again. When you rule and you reign. Throughout this creation. But Lord even now. To have you rule and reign. In our lives. Now, Father I pray. That you would help us to have that eternal joy, that joy unspeakable, full of glory, that joy that is beyond all that we can imagine, that joy, Lord, that is available by having you on the throne of our lives. And Lord, I pray that each of us, those who haven't yet received you and those of us who have, would make sure that you're in charge, that you're in control, that we're leaning on you and trusting in you for our lives, that we realize that we can't do it, but we realize you can. And Lord, we give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.